Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Today, December 9, is the International Genocide Prevention Day, marking the 73rd anniversary of the UN Genocide Convention of 1948. On this occasion, AGBU Europe, in partnership with the House of European History in Brussels, is pleased to host a webinar dedicated to a key figure in tackling the um, issue of stateless refugees after World War I, including stateless survivors of the Armenian Genocide. This event is also part of a European Remembrance Project carried out by the Armenian General Benevolent, Benevolent Union, AGBU Europe, in partnership with the Lepsius House in Potsdam, the European Union of Jewish Students, and the Roma organization Pirena Mensa. Entitled IDs and Their Consequences, Genocide and International Justice After 1919, the project is supported by the U Europe for Citizens program of the European Union. It is actually the last event of the project. And if you wish to learn more and watch any of our past lectures and webinars, you will find all the info on the website of the project. The link to the website will be placed in the chat shortly. I wish you a pleasant evening with our guest and leave the floor to our moderator, Olaf Klöckner, Senior Researcher at the Moses Mendelssohn Center for European Jewish Studies at Potsdam University. Olaf, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Celine, and uh, hi, everybody, to this uh, event uh, tonight, to this uh, concluding uh, event. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. Many of you know him already. Welcome to Dr. Roy Knocker our friend and colleague who is leading the Lepsius House Potsdam since the summer of this year, but doing a lot of research, international research and educational work also bound. Roy Knock is also a lecturer for history and philosophy at the University of Potsdam. And sometimes we have the privilege to conduct a seminar or lecture series there together, as for example, in the recent summer term, when running the lecture series, Humanitarianism as Historical Movement and International Challenge. Roy's research interests include comparative genocide studies, the history of humanitarianism, and the moral history of extreme political violence in the 20th century. In his doctoral thesis, he has dealt with the moral and socio-philosophical aspects of genocides in particular, with Achet and Shoah. In recent years, Roy has published books on Franz Werfel and the Armenian Genocide, as well as on the origins, manifestations, and aftermath of political violence in the 20th century. A new book on moral philosophical aspects on genocide is forthcoming in a couple of weeks, I guess. Uh, please, Roy, correct me if that's wrong. <laughs> and uh, aside this, Roy Knocker, since a couple of months now, is also the co-editor of the book series Politics of Violence and Human Rights, which appears in German, Gewaltpolitik und Menschenrechte. And this series is run by the prestigious publishing house Dunker and Humplot in Berlin since a couple of years. I know that our speaker doesn't like too many words on himself, so I decide to stop here at this point. Today, Roy Knocke will speak to us about Friedrich Nansen and the European blight of statelessness in the interwar period. Dear Roy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olaf, for this uh, kind introduction. So I will share with you a presentation and then we will start. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. I would like to start my presentation with a quote by Hannah Arendt to get an understanding of how a great number of people were situated after the collapse of the vast multi-ethnic Austro-Hungarian, Russian and Ottoman empire in the aftermath of World War I. So Hannah Arendt writes uh, in her famous book, The Origins of Totalitarianism in 1951 about this interwar period, which I will tackle 
uh, today. I quote, the calamity of the rightless is not that they are deprived of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or of equality before the law and freedom of opinion, formulas which were designed to solve problems within given communities, but that they no longer belong to any community whatsoever. Their plight is not that they are not equal before the law, but that no law exists for them, not that they are oppressed, but that nobody wants even to oppress them." End of quote. Expressed as a number for the interwar period, we speak of 9.5 million um, refugees um, in Europe. Nearly one third of them could be defined as statelessness. So this number is from 1926. Um, and I think that's, I mean, quite impressive, 9.5 million. So with the founding of the League of Nations in 1920, it was the plan to settle international disputes through negotiation and arbitration. So this is self-understanding of this peace treaties in Paris um, after World War I. This is a quote by Harold Nicholson, a British diplomat. And he says about these uh, League of Nations and these peace treaties, we came to Paris confident that the new order was about to be established. We left it convinced that the new order had merely fought the old. We were preparing not peace only, but eternal peace. There was about us the halo of some divine mission. We must be alert, stern, righteous, and ascetic, for we were bent on doing great, permanent, and noble things. The political leaders of 1919 hoped above all to avoid the crudest attacks on the interest of certain minorities and thus to prevent the hasty departure of refugees, which often occurred when a territory passed into other hands. It was assumed that national ambitions would be largely satisfied by geopolitical changes. State borders were to run where nationalities were divided and inhabitants of those regions were to recognize the authority of the state. But this organization, the League of Nations, was not really prepared for the vast humanitarian and refugee crisis in the interwar period. So how did the international community cope with so many people in need and the plight of statelessness? As we will see, this era was shaped by a melange of pragmatism, tentative, tentative models of aid and chagrin felt by many humanitarians. And so far, this humanitarian side of the interwar period coin was as crooked as the one characterized by the interplay of violence and modernity at the beginning of the 20th century. All these aspects can be studied vicariously through the life of the Norwegian Fridtjof Nansen, whose story as a humanitarian I would like to tell this evening. And I will do it in four parts. The first is about um, the early humanitarian work of Nansen. The second one um, is uh, something about the Nansen passport. I think a lot of, a lot of um, people in the audience know this kind of, um, Nansen passport or I heard of it, so I will elaborate a little bit more. Third, um, I will talk about Nansen and the exchange policy after the Greco-Turkish war. And fourth, um, Nansen and the fate of the Armenians. Nansen was both an intellectual man and a man of action. He was renowned in his days as an Arctic explorer, zoologist, oceanographer and diplomat. Before he became the High Commissioner for Refugees for the League of Nations in 1921, Nansen already embodied the dreams of his era. The aspiration to explore, study, and bringing nations forward through a progressive scientific way of thinking. You can see him here on the left as a young man, uh, on, on the right um, as the period I will talk about um, as a High Commissioner. Um, here's some other pictures. The left um, is, uh, is the first edition of his bestseller, Father's North, where he describes uh, in two volumes his um, 
uh, exploration to the explorations to the North Pole, and this was a bestseller. I mean, he uh, so this. I mean, he made it, uh, he made him rich this publication. And on the right side, you see, you can see Nansen as a um, scientist, uh, a zoologist um, around 1900. And you can say he was a public, almost heroic figure in his times. And the British writer and pacifist Vera Britton once called him a hero of every school child. Nansen earned his first diplomatic merits as ambassador in London from 1906 to 1908. One of the main tasks was to negotiate a treaty with the other European representatives to guarantee Norway, Norway's sovereignty. So um, there was a forced union between Norway and Sweden since 1814 and uh, the termination um, of this uh, forced union in 1905 under nationalistic banners. And during this time, Nansen saw himself more as an explorer and scientist than uh, as a politician. This changed with World War I, which we, he referred to as the greatest confession of defeat of humanity, the bitter fruits of which mankind must eat for a generation. So his first humanitarian engagement was actually in Norway itself. Due to the blockade of important international trade routes during World War I, famine threatened Scandinavia. After months of negotiations in Washington, Nansen, as a special ambassador, arranged for the USA to provide grain and other supplies. During the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, Nansen was an observer and lobbied for the recognition of the rights of small states. This was also a little bit of self-understanding. So Norway as a small state um, and also the diplomatic core in Norway um, as, a, as, a, as a means to, to be, uh, to, to seem bigger in, 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 the, in the international um, and politics. So he became the president of the League of Nations Society in Norway and advocated Norway's membership in the League of Nations which was effectuated in 1920. In the spring of 1920, Nansen was appointed by the League to set up relief plans for prisoners of war and to expedite the repatriation of two groups, Russians still in Germany and prisoners of war from the central powers in Siberia. He had to learn about, coordinate and encourage the work already accomplished on their behalf by governments and organizations such as the International Committee of the Red Cross and to regularly report to the council. Nearly, nearly you can see a picture here, nearly 430,000 prisoners of war from 26 different nationalities were finally repatriated in less than two years. Interesting is, I mean, we have to bear in mind that there was a revolution in Russia during uh, World War I and the tensions between the um, central powers and, uh, and, and Russia uh, were high at this point. And Nansen was the perfect candidate to, um, for this diplomatic and humanitarian mission because uh, he was received in Moscow more based on his scientific success and explorer rather than as a league of uh, as a league, as a representative of the league of nations this is quite important because the bolsheviks and later the soviets saw the league of nations as a capitalist um, conspiracy i will uh, come back later to that after that success he was uh, nansen was asked to fill the new position of a high commissioner for refugees in 1921 the idea to have a responsible person in the League to coordinate centralized with individual governments, voluntary agencies and private individuals was quite new, but one should not assume that this position was particularly lavishly endowed. No money was spent di on direct relief work, only administration costs were covered. That means money for the direct relief work had to be raised from private individuals or channel off and cooperations with other institutions like the International Red Cross. 
His main brief in this time was the resettlement of around 2 million Russian refugees displaced by the upheavals of the Russian Revolution. At the same time, he tried to tackle the famine in Russia. 30 million people suffered, which only succeeded partly through NGOs like the International Red Cross due to no support by the countries of the League. The Realpolitik of Western nations against the Bolsheviks and later Soviets disappointed Nansen and let him dashingly reply his well-known sentence, charity is Realpolitik. So this is quite interesting. And I mean, uh, Olaf, uh, Olaf said it, I, I mean, I work uh, in the Lepsius House, Potsdam. And so I think there's also a connection with the work of uh, Johannes Lepsius, um, who, saw, who saw his involvement during the Armenian reform program in 1913 uh, as a triumph of realpolitik based on ethical and not imperialistic grounds. So an, an insight, as we know, uh, today, which was bitterly disillusioned with the beginning of World War I. And Nansen had also a similar experience um, for the Armenians, as we will see at the end of the presentation. But this phrase, charity is realpolitik, um, is, uh, points, to a, points to, I think, a, a character side of Nansen, that he was a, quite an idealistic um, uh, person um, uh, in terms of humanitarian aid. And this was always a tension between the political landscape and what um, was possible to do on the humanitarian side. If one compares the efforts of the American Relief Administration, the ARA, and the Nansen team, as historian Carl Emil Vogt has convincingly shown, the ARA mobilized more money to fight the famine. The idea in 1921 was not only to stem the tide of communism, but also to enter Russia, the heart of the communist threat to the world with vast quantities of aid to undermine and eventually overthrow the regime. So this is the, um, let's say the path of the history of humanitarianism with uh, Wilson and Herbert Hoover. So I, I don't speak about this anymore because we will focus on Nansen, but um, the idea was, or yeah, the idea was American policymakers, um, they believed that an effective response to the grievances of the Russian people would remove any reason to support the Bolsheviks and that a liberal regime could be established. As President Woodrow Wilson told Congress in 1919, this famous quote, I quote, Bolshevism is advancing steadily westward and poisoning Germany. It cannot be stopped by force, but it can be stopped by food. End of quote. So the idea behind this is to mix up political, geopolitical aspects um, with uh, humanitarian aid. And I mean, Nansen, I think he, he saw it in a way because he also worked uh, with Herbert Hoover um, in uh, 2021 uh, and 22. Um, but it was not, I think, his, his point of view. So that's more the American side. Let's come to the second point, um, the Nansen passport. One main problem in the humanitarian efforts for refugees was the legal status without documentation. So that takes up Aaron's quote from the beginning. Before, 19, for, uh, before 1914, traveling through Europe had been relatively liberal without many constraints. So maybe some of you know um, Stefan Zweig, Die Welt von Gestern, The World of Yesterday. And there he describes this traveling in the era of the Belle Epoque. And he describes that he travels from Europe uh, to the Middle East and to Asia without ever showing any papers, passports, or whatsoever on his, on his way. World War I changes this uh, open atmosphere dramatically due to implementing restrictive legislation requiring passports and visas. So how could the Russian refugees travel to other countries? Nansen discussed the issues with diplomats and legal scholars on a few international conferences and introduced in 1922, a simple and radical way, which became known as the Nansen passport. 
So you can see two um, examples here, and I will elaborate it on that. After the passport had initially, initially been invented exclusively for Russian stateless persons, the League of Nations conferences successfully extended the internationally recognized identification and travel document to other groups, always defined according to national origins. With Armenian refugees since 1924 and Aramaic Christians since 1928, um, so that means Assyrians, uh, Armenians, um, Azero Chaldeans, um, it applied to survivors of genocide and expulsion in the Middle East and in the 1930s also to Jewish refugees from National Socialism. And you can see here two examples. Uh, the left one, this is from 1927. So this is a, a Russian refugee, Rebecca Edelstone, uh, which uh, lives uh, in, uh, in, in Great Britain. And on the other side, you can find this is from 30, uh, 39. Um, also a Russian refugee, which uh, uh, seeks uh, uh, refuge in, uh, in Germany at this time. And interesting is it's always the same, the same, let's say, uh, the, the same data sheet. You have, you have the the names here. You have the date of birth, the place of birth, of course, occupation, the former uh, residence, uh, in, in this case in Russia, and the present residence. Then you have this uh, description of the person with the uh, hair color, the eye color. Then there are two strange things. I think today we see face and the nose. You know. Uh, how they looked like. And of course, a photo. The first refugee card in the world was developed for stateless refugees in the face of the Russian Revolution at their places of exile or stopovers, primarily in Western, Central, and Eastern Europe, South America, and the Far East. They thus form the original group of political refugees of the 20th century. The certificate was a substitute identity card for undocumented people that authenticated their identity of origin instead of a home authority and at the same time created a substitute identity as a refugee in a new homeland. The group of eligible holders, persons of Russian origin who had not acquired a new nationality, so that was the formal phrase for that, formed the first refugee definition according to a case-based collective and nationally defined concept of refugee. The actual situation, statelessness, remain unspoken with regard to the bearers and as, it, and as did it cause in the aggression of state against undesirable population groups. So this kind of uh, concept of refugee is a collective concept. It's, that's not the concept we have today. Today we have an individual um, uh, concept of, of, of refugees. I mean, in the, in the, on the legal, uh, on, on, the, on the legal level. So this was a, a collective way to define them. However, the special document for stateless refugees was by no means accessible to all stateless persons, not even to all refugees among them. About 100,000 stateless persons in the successor states of the Habsburg Empire, especially Hungarians, Austrians, Ruthenians, Jews, or those affected by the German-Polish border shifts remain excluded. Neither the intergovernmental conferences of the League of Nations nor the assemblies for the codification of international law could bring themselves to generalize the model status for all those affected or even to outlaw statelessness as international lawyers, minority representatives and humanitarian actors had been demanding since the beginning of the 1920s. Statelessness as a contemporary mass phenomenon and political problem was not solved in this way, contrary to what was hoped for at the time and is still widely assumed today. The certificate was not an international or even universal passport or permit, 
but a national substitute passport for foreigners, the issue of which was regulated internationally. In the interwar period, it was, it was issued um, to about 450,000 people. Its limited scope illustrates the ambivalence of refugee policy measures after the First World War and the function of the certificate to facilitate the departure of unwanted refugees and to relieve the host countries. Nevertheless, the practical effects of this passport were decisive. Proof of identity made it possible to find housing and also work. It was a necessity and an, 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 it was a necessary prerequisite for the bureaucratic side of a civic life with marriage, the acquisition of property, and so on. Formalized refugee, refugee status entitled people to assistance from aid organizations or state bodies in some European countries, but required repeated certification at short intervals. It subjected the holders to grueling bureaucratic harassment often experienced as a humiliating or arbitrary. The writer Vladimir Nabokov remembers the Nansen passport as a, I quote, highly inferior document of sickly green color. Its holder was little more than a paroled criminal, end of quote. I must uh, add that um, Nabokov was, uh, was one of the Nansen um, uh, passport holders. Um, uh, another one, uh, famous people were Marc Chagall or um, Igor Stravinsky, for example. After one year, the certificate had to be renewed. It did not mean secure asylum status, but it formally, not necessarily factually, protected against deportation and was the requirement for the individual visas that had to be obtained each time a person crossed the border for which it served as a supporting document. Before return visas were permitted in 1926, however, holders often did not dare to cross the border for fear of losing their country of refuge after their homeland. Nevertheless, the Nansen refugees were considered privileged. Hannah Arendt sarcastically refer to them as the arist aristocracy among the stateless people. At the same time, the novel document aroused hope as documented by numerous letters of request for the assurance of the League of Nations passport and the archives of the League of Nations. To sum up this part, the Nansen certificate was an internationally negotiated technical bureaucratic response to new kinds of political aggressions against vulnerable populations, documenting identity, the origin, instead of the home country, and establishing a new identity as a refugee. It can be interpreted as an attempt at normalization by means of a provisional arrangement. The document, which was supposed to enable the mobility of stateless groups through their repatriation or naturalizations to a country of refuge actually created a substitute identity as a stateless person. So I will come on now to the, to the third part, Nansen and the exchange policy after the Greco-Turkish war. The end of the Greco-Turkish war, which um, goes from 1919 to 1922, brought about with the defeat of the Greek army by the Turks and the fire of Smyrna that destroyed much of the city in September 1922, occurred, uh, occurred while the Russian refugee question was still far from being settled. On September 19, the League's assembly authorized Nansen to use the services of the Russian refugee organization to provide assistance for the relief of refugees from the Near East and to administer the money collected to, for this purpose. The Greek government gave Nansen full powers to proceed with negotiations for the exchange of prisoners of war and detained civilians between Greece and Turkey. In addition, thanks to the backing of the Allied High Commissioners, who had administered the city of Constantinople after the general armistice of November 1918, 
Nansen negotiated the terms of the reciprocal exchange of populations. The question then became part of the peace negotiations in Lausanne. Nansen and the leader of the Greek delegation, Eleftherios Venizelos, concurred on the necessity of making an exchange of populations between Greece, Greece and Turkey compulsory. Nansen left on an investigative trip to the Near East, accompanied by Noel Baker and Arthur Salter, head of League of Nations financial um, section. In October, while in Athens, he proposed to head all foreign and national organizations under a centralized coordination committee. The letter did not become operational as such, but turned out to be a clearinghouse for information through the publication of an information bulletin. In November, Nansen and his staff established a mission in Western Trace, which relieved and resettled 10,000 refugees. The population exchange, exchange was seen as the best form of minority protection, as well as the most radical and humane remedy of all. That's a quote by Nansen. Nansen believed that what was on the negotiation table at Lausanne was not ethno-nationalism, but rather a question that demanded a quick and efficient resolution without a minimum of delay. He believed that economic, uh, the, the economic component of the problem of Greek and Turkish refugees de uh, deserved the most um, attention. So this is a quote by Nansen about this, um, this topic, which is a hot topic uh, today as well. Um, and there you can see uh, Nansen's position on this kind of um, exchange policy. Such an exchange will provide Turkey immediately and in the best conditions with the population necessary to continue the exploitation of the cultivated lands which the departed Greek populations have abandoned. The departure from Greece of its Muslim citizens would create the possibility of rendering self-supporting a great proportion of the refugees now concentrated in the towns and different parts of Greece. Nansen recognized that difficulties were truly immense, acknowledging that population exchange would require, I quote, the displacements of populations of many more than 1 million people. And he advocated, I quote, uprooting these people from their homes, transferring them to a strange new country, registering, valuing, and liquidating the individual property which they abandoned and securing to them the payment of their just claims to the value of this property, end of quote. So what you can see here is, yeah, you can see a, a tension between this population exchange and he knows that this is um, connected with suffering as well. But on the other hand, the, um, the economic, let's say, um, upside of it. Yeah. In September 1923, Nansen presented the settlement plans to the League's Assembly as a model that could be reproduced a number of times in the country. He also argued in favor of an international loan to Greece and wanted to refugee settlement and wanted the refugee settlement commission, which worked within the framework of the league to put under his control. This did not occur and this commission maintained a large degree of autonomy. So this is also, let's say the tension of the political side, you know, I mean, Nansen as a humanitarian and to see, okay, it works somehow, so maybe we can do something more. Um, but the League of Nations, and that's what's connected to the things I said in the beginning, um, we're not really prepared for that. Uh, I will go to the last point, Nansen and the fate of the Armenians. Um, in August, so we have now the, we have to connect this with the ideas of the prison of prisoners of war and in Russia, we can uh, connect this with the uh, 
uh, also with the population, uh, population exchange um, after the Greco-Turkish War. And in August 1923, um, Gabriel Noradungian, president of the Armenian National Delegation, addressed two letters to the League uh, to the League's Council, reporting the conditions of the post-genocide Armenians and asking for the extension of Nansen's mandate to this group. Nansen formulated two plans for the settlement of Armenian refugees to Soviet Armenia and Syria. On September 25th, um, 20, in 1924, the Council passed a resolution asking the High Commissioner and the International Labour Organization to make a formal inquiry into possibilities of creating an Armenian settlement plan in the Caucasus. Two days later, Anansen convened a conference in Geneva where it was stated that 300,000 Russian and 200,000 Armenian refugees still needed to be settled. Although repatriation was considered to, the, uh, to be the best solution, the opposition of Soviet and Turkish authorities made it almost impossible. So this is another situation. Um, uh, if you compare it to, to the, the, the Greeks and the, and the Turks. Also fighting against the unwillingness of some within the League of Nations circles to end its involvement in the refugee question, Nansen held private negotiations with the International Labour Organization's director, Albert Thomas, in spring of 19, uh, 1924, because Nansen believed that the employment was central to the solution of the refugee question. The arrangement between the League and the International Labour Organization came into force on January 1925. While Nansen continued with political negotiations and issues connected with the Nansen passport, the International Labour Organization began to find employment for the refugees. In line with Nansen's mandate, the International Labour Organization would not provide direct relief to refugees and the organization's involvement was to be temporary. Nansen visited Armenia and proposed a settlement scheme with a modest plan for an area where refugees could be settled. The League created a commission for the settlement of Armenian refugees. However, this body did not produce any concrete results and the proposed settlement scheme was abandoned, mainly because there was no interest by the countries of the League of Nations to endow migration into the Soviet Union and no one was willing to provide the funds for Nansen plan, for Nansen's plan. When it became evident that, Caucasian, that, that the Caucasian settlement scheme could not be implemented, Nansen managed to settle 10,000 Armenians in Yerevan and 40,000 Armenians in Lebanon. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, we, this 50,000 people and uh, we, we talked about uh, around about uh, half a million um, uh, Armenian refugees. Looking back, uh, looking back at the last years of his life, Nansen described the full force of Realpolitik regarding the Armenians in his comprehensive book, Armenia and the Near East, which is not only homage to the Armenian culture, but also a bitter analysis of the Armenian question, which connects from Lepsius' early works after the Hamidian massacres, as well to aspects we discussed um, earlier. So let me close this presentation, not very pleasant, with Nansen's own judgment. I quote Nansen um, about these um, Armenian settlement plans. We have seen that the Western powers of Europe and the United States of America have given words and nothing else by way of fulfilling the promises to the Armenian people, which they had made with such solemnity when they needed support in war. So that, that refers to the, to, the, um, to the press and humanitarian aid uh, during World War I. Then he continues, the nations of Europe and the statesmen of Europe are tired of the everlasting Armenian question, of course. And after all, it was only a massacred but gifted little nation 
with no oil fields or gold mines. Woe to the Armenian people that they were ever drawn into European politics. It would have been better for them if the name Armenia had never been uttered by any European diplomats. But the Armenian people have never abandoned hope. They have gone on bravely working and waiting, waiting year after year. They are waiting still. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Roy, for providing us with such interesting and detailed uh, insights and several initiatives uh, like the ROA and the Nansen team. But first of all, in the, the insights in the life and works of uh, Fritjof Nansen, who has been, of course, I think, outstanding in his humanitarian uh, activities as an individual person, especially his activities for the survive, war survivors and refugees in the context of World War I and its aftermath. Um, yeah, we know there was a lot of reference to his personality. He became also a Nobel laureate and so on. But you have decided to close your presentation with one of his rather frustrated judgments. So maybe let's uh, um, put this point a bit uh, more. What do you think in, in which regards would you say was Fritjof Nansen, even as the refugees high commissioner of the League of Nations, uh, uh, just feeling to be unheard or ignored or even uh, disregarded? And uh, did he try, for example, in these cases of uh, lacking financial support or just unwillingness for 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 uh, for just um, organizing some measures more from international side or from, from international politics uh, did he try to intervene or just uh, intensify his uh, um, his efforts but uh, but the main question is rather uh, how did he deal with this kind of uh, ignorance and uh, disregard yeah, I mean, I think we have to bear in mind that Nansen always was a prisoner of this um, of this tension between the political level in the interwar period and the humanitarian efforts, which anyway um, uh, had happened. I mean, for the Armenians since the, since, uh, the end of the 19th century. And... I mean, I began my, my presentation. He was a delegated um, to negotiate the exchange of prisoners of war. So this was something the League of Nations um, said, okay, we, we have to do this because um, we want this eternal peace, this, this British diplomat uh, talked about. And so we start with this. So this is something I think the League of Nations on a political level and also with the organizations where where there was no real problem to organize it but the other examples um, i um, uh, 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 i presented um these are some kind of let's say it, it moves a little bit away from the from the mandate and the political level and so nansen always had to um had to connect with private institutions for fundraising, so there there was no money from the from from, from the from the League of Nations uh, state uh, uh, state of uh, level. So this I think this this tension um, he experienced and the pessimistic ending I think is his maybe his experience after more than ten years um, experiencing these tensions and to say okay this is something i i don't get it i mean and 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 the phrase i think charity is realpolitik i mean this is this is this is quite interesting because um i mean he was he was not so naive that he that he didn't see this political level um which i think you, uh, from this quote charity is realpolitik you can imagine or you can uh, derive on uh, from um so i think he he, he more thought in ways that the political, the political level could also, um, let's say, 
um, increase their geopolitical influence if there is humanitarian aid um, uh, to be done. And for the Armenians, I think for him, this is this was a new experience. I mean, during the Armenian massacres, he was uh, exploring the North Pole. And uh, after that, um, as a professor um, uh, back in Norway, um, he there, there was no real connection to the Armenians. This is more at the end of his life. I mean, he dies in May 1930. So this quote was two years ago and was his last, uh, his last work. And I think in this, uh, in this book, um, Armenia and, uh, and, uh, and the East, you can see um, that he understands that this political question for Armenia, the Armenian, so-called Armenian question, has a long, long history. And I think this is, this is connecting with this pessimistic stand, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something which, which, which he sees in a historical, more in a historical, let's say, a framework. Otherwise, I mean, the prison of, of war is, is, I mean, there were prisoners of war and they should have, uh, they, they had to be exchanged somehow. So I will organize it. And then uh, that's, that's, that's okay. But with the other, uh, with the other humanitarian aid and especially with the Armenians, this is, that somehow goes deeper. So this is my, uh, this is my reading or my, my view on, on, on Nansen on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably he already uh, felt this uh, tendency in the direction of, of, of uh, or the, 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 the threat of uh, coming uh, uh, genocide even before. But uh, then when he, when he was acting there and tried to, you said it was a, 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 a relatively uh, small number of uh, saved or resettled and then saved uh, uh, Armenian people, 40,000 in, 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 in Lebanon uh, itself. So I, I think in, in total number, of course, it's, uh, it's a lot that just a, a little question aside. So he probably needed a team. He couldn't uh, organize it by himself yeah, as, a, yeah. as a high commissioner or just. And uh, was there any kind of uh, uh, continuity? Uh, um, I, just, I just remember Johannes Lepsius, who had, of course, German organizations and there were Germany was uh, connected with, uh, with, uh, with the um, Osmanic Empire, uh, with the Ottoman Empire in, in, in quite complex ways and just in, in, in positive ways and in negative, if you look at the the, the German uh, military forces who who stood by there during the genocide, but mm -hmm. but uh, if if I if I if I if I see it right, there there's a lot of continuity until today. Special bonds between Armenia and uh, at least some special German organizations until uh, today, because they they remember there is a kind of uh, mutual uh, politics of uh, commemoration. Uh, is there some kind of uh, similar continuity between some uh, successors of Friedhof Nansen uh, on the Norwegian side and the Armenian uh, people and the state of our Armenia today as well? You mean uh, between Norway and yeah, Armenia? Yeah, Norway and Armenia. I think so. I mean, I'm not an expert on Norway <laughs> uh, foreign politics, so... Uh, but but I think so. I mean I mean what what we know of course is that Nansen is uh, like Lepsius and other people are uh, quite uh, well known um, in, in Armenia of course. Um, but I mean to to connect to the to your question um, about the networks. I mean if there if there was there a connection between for example nansen and the, the lepsius uh, humanitarian works so i think not not in the not in a direct way but um of course nansen um uh, collaborated with uh, bigger institutions i mean like the international labor organization like the international red cross like the near east relief which uh, uh which is connected to for example Lepsis relief um, as society and, and relief work. So these are the big players that the safe uh, the safe uh, safe the children fund um, or the um, the ARA the American Relief Association uh, which uh, Herbert Hoover uh, was a president of. So this this I think these connections are there and you, you must. Uh, 
or we, we have to see that he organized it in an administrative way uh, from Europe and with a small team. Um, but of course, the, the real work on site um, were done by locals. I mean, it's, it's like if you compare it, for example, I mean, uh, with uh, Herbert Hoover's um, ARA, uh, they, they, they had a long negotiations with the Bolsheviks um, during the uh, 1920s. And after a long, long time of negotiations, the Bolsheviks finally say, okay, you can, you can somehow help us because, I mean, it's, it was a disastrous uh, uh, situation for, for, the, yeah, for, the, for the Russian people. And, um, and, and so they helped. And, but uh, interesting is that the ARA, they, it was a big organization. They had 4,000 um, people in the US um, and Europe but they had 140,000 uh, people, uh, locals, which, uh, uh, which, which did the humanitarian work in Russia then. So, and they saved uh, around about 10 million people um, at this time. So this is, um, this, is, this, is, this is a number for the ARA. For Nansen, it's not, it's not so easy to say. I mean, it's maybe, maybe a couple of hundred uh, people who were um, busy in the administrations, um, but then the locals. But I must say that the research on Nansen is, I mean, there's not much. I mean, there are some people from Norway who publishing just uh, uh, not in English and, and uh, 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 so there was no, no real, no real in-depth research on that, yeah. Mm. Okay, I see some. So, yeah. No, you, well, you, you. It was, it was perfect. You, your, your, your uh, last statements completely fit with the first uh, question we have in Q, uh, Q and A. Uh, the question by Bartolomeo Kühn was who supported Nansen's work and projects mainly? Who were his allies? I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I answered that. I guess. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I think. <laughs> So we we have one question more in the in the in the chat as I see here. Please, if you have more questions, primarily uh, put it in the in the Q and A. But but in the chat, you have a, one of the uh, participants ask you. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Does does the in the end almost useless Nansen passport reflect the political failure of the League of Nations and its values? And then in Clems, as you said in your comments, he understood that charity is real politics. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, the Nancy passport. Okay. I mean, I must confess, I was a little bit pessimistic in my historical um, analysis. Maybe that's, uh, uh, I have to stand a little bit corrected if you, if you look um, from the historical side. I mean, the historical side is that the Nansen passport somehow um, was some. It was a practical, a, a practical um, in, uh, uh, invention by Nansen, and was not so much um, connected with the League of Nations values. I mean, the League of Nations values in in this uh, uh, in this uh, direction was more. We we do not really know what 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 we should do and. Um, Maybe the best thing is we do humanitarian aid, but um, answering the question of a legal status of a refugee, uh, this was not, not really tackled at this time. So that's my historical reading. I mean, there were conferences and there were legal scholars debating about that, but there was no real um, international solution. And so I think then the Nansen passport is more, it was more a practical way for just a few, I mean, uh, I said 430, 450,000 people, and uh, the number from the beginning was 9.5 million. Um, so the relation uh, could be interpreted a little bit pessimistic, but you also can say, yeah, I mean, it was a beginning, and it was a beginning um, to think about the legal status. I mean, that, that's, I think that's the important thing. I mean to 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 start a debate on that, and if you if you go more into the interwar period later on, and then of course after forty five, I mean all the ideas of refugees and international law, 
um, they are connected somehow to this period. Period, not always in a ca causal uh, or in a monocausal way, but I think um, this is something. And it, it served, if I understood you right, it also served in a, in a certain way also uh, the, the Nansen passport as a role model for a few other groups at the end of the 1920s. Uh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. so there was something of uh, uh, successful working with it in practice. Yeah, okay. I mean, from, from our standpoint, of course, we say, ah, this is a passport which... Uh, uh, what's it, uh, a toothless uh, tiger or something like this? Uh, I don't know if this is correct in English. Um, and, uh, and, and we see it, I mean, from our perspective, we see, we see the, the question or the, 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 the subject um, refugee as an individual person, because uh, we have this, uh, we have this, um, uh, this development after uh, 45 and, and uh, our modern thinking of this is, is an individual, individualistic thinking. But in this time, it was a collective one. It's the same with the, with the uh, term genocide. I mean, the genocide uh, coined by Raphael Lemkin and, um, and, the, uh, and the early uh, 30s, his ideas of vandalism and barbarism, um, so it was always a collective definition of um, of these crimes, yeah, and yeah. this 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 is connected, of course, with the essentialistic um, thinking um, in the 20th century in the beginning. So, and this shifts later on, of course. And this is this is a big debate. I mean, and this is also. I mean, I quoted Arendt, and that he that she was a little bit uh, frustrated about the Nansen passport um, because she. Um, she, she sees this kind of, let's say, individualistic uh, perspective. Uh, uh, it's, it's better than, than the other one. But okay. she, was in, she was in good company with some of the artists and writers. And uh, thanks for quoting uh, Vladimir Nabokov as well, who also just made some kind of uh, cynical jokes on his uh, Nansen uh, passport. Um, as I see, the discussion will continue on the Nansen passport. Uh, Laura Mirachian, uh, forgive me if I spell your name not right. <laughs> Laura Mirachian asks, how many Armenians could have an Anson passport? Armenians. Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I I found I found two um, numbers uh, uh, in the literature. So one is uh, by Bruno Cabanet, who, who wrote this, uh, this important book on the origins of humanitarianism and the Great War. And he states uh, around about 12,000 um, uh, uh, Armenian, Armenians uh, got the Nansen passport. And uh, in another publication, I don't know, it was a paper somewhere, it was around about 16,000. I don't know the exact number, but um, these are the numbers in the literature, uh, which I can give. Um, but maybe, but that's a good question because I think maybe that's um, that could be uh, that could be a question to uh, get in touch again with the uh, archive um, of the League of Nations because um, they should have the exact number somewhere, you know. Good, we switch to a uh, Russian population. The next question from a participant is, many Russians fled to Germany after the revolution. What happened with Russian refugees in Germany holding the Nansen passport when the Nazis came to power in Germany? Yeah, I mean, you cannot say this in general. I mean, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of passport holders uh, still lived in, uh, uh, in in Germany because the idea of the Nansen passport was not um, it was the, was the origin and the origin in this case uh, it, it didn't matter it was it was not defined as an enemy or so I mean I showed you the picture of this one Nansen passport and this passport was from thirty nine as so, uh, nineteen thirty nine so this was a time where uh, okay there was there was no uh, World War II and no no um, uh, conflict in this case, um, but 
I think you have to look at individually in this case. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, we we go back to uh, uh, we go back to your theoretical uh, perspectives. Uh, the statement you brought before, uh, Laura Mirachian is asking what. Uh, what's a collective concept of, as uh, what's a collective concept of refugee? What does it mean for you? The collective concept of refugee. I mean, the collective concept is that it was. I mean, the first, the first, um, the first passport was um, the so-called. I, I quote: "Persons of Russian origin who had not acquired a new nationality." So this was just for Russians. That's, that's what the collective concept means, just for Russians, then later on for Armenians, later on uh, for, for um, uh, um, uh, our Armenians. Uh, so the idea was a, ref a refugee was someone who was, let's say, Armenian. And it was not a person, let's say, maybe uh, also lived maybe in, uh, in, in the Ottoman Empire in Eastern Anatolia somewhere. Uh, was not Armenian, but was whatever. I mean, these, these ethnic, these ethnic, um, these ethnic um, categories. That's what I mean with a collective um, a concept of refugee. And today we say um, this a refugee. If, if someone is a refugee from Syria, I mean, of course you say he's from Syria, blah blah. Um, but the the legal status. Um, is approved individually, you know, and and uh, some people uh, can stay um, and are acknowledged as a refugee. Some are not, so it doesn't matter um, if they see themselves as Syrians or not. Um, or the the language is a, and and the, the language and the legal um, level is another one uh, compared to to this period and the, or compared to the interwar period. That's what I meant. I hope it's clear, Laura. If not, <laughs> please ask again. Yeah. No, we have another question uh, regarding the, the tools of research. We go back to on the field of historians. Uh, Jill Pelayo is asking, where can we find the statistics on holders of Nansen passports by country of origin and year? I mean, the League of Nations, they have an archive in Geneva. Um, and there you can find um, these things. And you also can find, um, um, or you can also find um, it in the different uh, countries uh, where the refugees um, went to. I mean, if you, if you look in the, uh, in the uh, archive of the Ministry of Interiors, for example, in Great Britain, you also can find um, uh, these kind of passports. But the first address, I would suggest um, the League of Nations. Thank you. There's a lot of thanks and compliments. And another question. Uh, did the USA recognize the Nansen passport apart from the... Oh, from the RICO? What, what's the yeah, RICO? From the RICO, it stopped. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Nabokov is a good example for this. Yeah, maybe we can. I mean, we had, I mean, uh, uh, it, I mean, there were in, I think, in the 19, mid of the 1920s, um, if I remembered correctly, 53 um, states recognizing the Nansen passport. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, this is something yeah. uh, Nansen lobbied all the time for. And this is, uh, I think, this is this is a great success in, yeah. in one way. I mean, even we only know from 430,000 um, people. And uh, which, which, which countries have been accepted? Oh, I don't know, all the okay. 53. Um, okay. we, we have to, I have okay. to check this, but the okay. USA is definitely. Stop. Um, I stopped making you pain. Um, I would like maybe still go uh, together to, to another region, but but also a central part of your presentation. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, that Richard Nansen had then also his diplomatic mission uh, in um, 
and the end of the Turkish Greek war in the early 1920s. And he became one of the operator or organizer, even the organizer or one of the responsible uh, functioners of the, of the League of Nations uh, to starting this great experience or program of uh, resettlement uh, Greeks from, from the Ottoman Empire to, to Greece and then the other way around with the, with the Turkish inhabitants. Uh, and you said on the one hand, of course, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a lot of individual suffering if people have to, to leave their, their place of living after 20, 40 or 70 years or what, whatever. So a lot of, uh, we can uh, assume a lot of uh, individual tragedies, tragedies, but uh, you also said uh, you think in this, uh, in this context, in this, uh, in, in, in this special conflict situation, this is a political question, of course. Uh, it was rather uh, the, the only solution that, that uh, maybe you can just uh, uh, explain that a little bit more. And, 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 and the second question also in this context would be, I could imagine that these kind of programs and measures, maybe not uh, uh, Nansen by himself, but uh, that there uh, emerged a lot of conflict with uh, human rights organizations who were on the ground there as well. Did any conflicts between organizations uh, arose in this situation when resettlement started or, uh, or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to uh, make clear that what I talked about mm -hmm. was Nansen's perspective yeah. from a historical point of view. That's not my personal yeah, yeah. Uh, point of view. Okay. That I uh, oh, that yeah. I think mm -hmm. that it was a good thing. Yes. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I mean Nansen. I, I mean Nansen thought it, it was. I mean I quoted him. He he he, he said it is the most radical and humane remedy. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he he told it. But the problem was, of course. I mean. There were there was no um, supporting. Um, there was no supporting these exchanges in a way that um, it was not possible to exploit um, the both sides, both populations, um, uh, each other. So there was no control instance. That's the point. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the idea was okay. We we have to do this and. Of course, there was this economic side, and there were also programs afterwards. Um, but the, the the control mechanisms. I mean, we, we do not have this at this time. Yeah. And um, I think the the thing we can say critically is that that um, Nansen was not aware of that in uh, in a way we would be aware of that um, uh, today. So. That's that's a that's a big difference, but anyway, it was. I mean, this this uh, exchange in politics. Um, I mean, this is something which which the after World War One um, is part of um, uh, forming the geopolitical um, uh, landscape yeah. and the minority landscape in, in all of Europe, also in the south southeast Europe. I mean, this is something. It happens, and uh, yeah. And for Nansen, it was it was the 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 only the only uh, solution, only option in this point. Yeah. Um, about these conflicts, um, you mean conflicts um, between With, humanitarian uh, humanitarian organizations on the ground who just uh, did couldn't follow this kind of idea just of resettlement. No, or just no, I no, of, uh, no. I think that, that's the, that's the mindset in this time. I mean, this mm -hmm. is something which they which they not really um, discussed. And even I mean, if you look at Armenia and the Near East, the last uh, the last book by Nansen, um, I mean, he also talks about this um, exchange uh, uh, exchange policy, and he. He does not really reflect on that. Yeah. I mean, in a critical way. So for him, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a possible, political and humanitarian somehow, uh, working uh, working solution. A very distinct humanitarian individual perspective, just to look for what is the best solution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I think we always have to bear in mind that this is also a time of experimenting yeah. um, with these uh, humanitarian uh, 
uh, or forms of humanitarian aid. I mean, this is, this is something we forget today because um, all the NGOs with their high moral standards, um, uh, you know. Searching for the perfect solution. Good, from my side, thank you again. Thanks very much, Roy, for being also uh, standing for all these kind of uh, uh, differentiated uh, answers and additional perspectives. I Actually, I don't see more questions either in the chat nor in the Q&A. I'm, I'm grateful I, I learned a lot from quite different points also from the uh, from the life and work of Friedrich of uh, Nansen. Uh, as I mentioned before, a real uh, shining light, uh, which we uh, hope to have more in the future as well from all the nations, <laughs> not only from Norway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I give the word back to Celine. Yes, uh, thank you, Roy, and thank you, Olaf, uh, for this presentation. Uh, indeed, I guess if there are uh, not any other questions, we may end a bit early. Um, and anyone who wants to rewatch this session, it will be on the website of the project. So you'll have the chance to watch it again. And you can continue to follow us to, to follow the results of the project. And hopefully we'll um, join again for other events. So thanks again, everyone. And thank you for joining and good evening.